John chapter 18, let's begin in verse 1. When, the, when, the, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with the disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he had said to him, I am he, to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you have gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given or given me? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this amazing word. Thank you that we get to mine every part of it and discover what you have revealed uh, for us for this day, Lord. And we, we thank you that your word won't return void, that it'll accomplish every purpose it's sent to accomplish, Lord. We're not interested in just merely re at all religious exercise, Lord. We're interested in engaging and encountering you and meeting with you. Jesus, you said, if we continue in your word, we're your disciples indeed. We know, Lord, that, that growth comes from having your word sown into the right heart, the heart that's ready to obey you, the heart that's ready to show you love by obedience. We want to have hearts that are like that. So when your word is sown, it produces a crop that's, that's exponential. So we pray that you would bear fruit through us. We want to glorify you with everything that happens through in and through our lives, Lord. We yield to your Holy Spirit this morning. We pray that he would be our teacher this morning. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we've been for months, we've been, it seems like anyway, we've been in the upper room uh, going over, having watching Jesus share these things with his disciples where he was bearing his heart to them, preparing them for what's coming, knowing that it would, that what they, their faith would be severely tested by this um, trial of what, what Jesus was going to go through. They would see that they would, they would experience it from a distance. And God knows that uh, we feel, deal with struggle. We deal with hardship. He doesn't want our faith uh, uh, interfered with. He wants us to be fortified. And so he puts all these things in his word for so many different purposes. G as, as I've said a handful of times during the, this couple years that we've been in this study, that um, John was writing this 30 to 40 years after the last gospel was written. Long time. And, and so they've had all this experience with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and the body of Christ has. And so the Apostle John had the unique opportunity, he was an eyewitness, of course, to be able to add to and, and say the things that he wanted to say that was on his heart that maybe he felt was missing from the record at that time and wrote all these things down. And it's interesting when you see the, the seven I am statements, that you see all these things that we've highlighted, we've gone through uh, all the different, all these signs that he did that pointed to Jesus being the Christ, the son of the living God. That was his thesis. He says that at the end of the book. That's why these things are written. So now Jesus has been preparing the, these disciples, telling them these hard things, um, telling them the things they needed to hear. But now we go from this upper room discourse that he's been uh, explaining to them, teaching them. He goes from that to this narrative there where now John is explaining what's happening for the, for the most part and just narrating what's happening. And then... Um, you know, this, this account here of us, of him in the garden of Gethsemane and this arrest and everything, it is just one snapshot because the synoptics give a lot more detail on a lot of things. If you ever do a, a life and ministry of Christ in chronological order study, you get to see everything all at once. Uh, but that's not what we're doing. We're just going through the book of John here. So there's things missing here. There's no kiss. He doesn't kiss Judas. Um, 
There's no agony that you see in the other ones where he's praying and, and there's great drops of blood, sweating great drops of blood, as it were, from him. Uh, he doesn't say to Peter that he could call 12 legions of angels down if he, if, if he were, wanted to. He could ask the Father. We don't see that. There's so much that we don't see, but, but it makes sense because the Apostle John is saying what he's saying for a purpose. His whole purpose is talking about that he's the God-man. He's God in human flesh. He's the Son of God. Son of God is a title of deity. Um, when they would say the son of the prophets, they, they were talking about the prophets were, the, in other words, if you're a son of a prophet, you had the nature of a prophet. It was normal for them to say, so the son of God is saying that you have the nature of God, you're, that you are God in human flesh. So he's, so John's focusing on the deity of Christ. And so, um, he starts in verse one. He says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he, uh, he and his disciples entered. So the brook Kidron, if you've been to Israel, you know, it's about 200 feet below the surface of the temple mount. Uh, and the Western side, um, you know, you, you, I mean, it's really high up there. That, that Temple Mount. I mean, you look down in the Kidron Valley, and it, it, it went through there. It had a purpose why they they had it. It, it means, um, it, people think that it means cedar, but it actually means dark or black. And it got that name because they would do these sacrifices, and they would pour out this the, the, the result of these sacrifices, the blood, and it would, after a time, turn black, and it would flow through that through that. And so because of that, the Romans installed a 30-mile pipeline that would help bring all of that through that through that brook and everything. And so that's, you know, they have to cross over that that area to get to the, the Mount of Olives where it's the, the Garden of Gethsemane is not at the peak of the Mount of Olives. It's down below in between the, the Kidron Valley and the peak there, the place where Jesus is going to come back physically when the second coming happens. So there's that, the, that, that garden called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means oil press which is ironic, and it's talking about these gardens of oil, I mean, of um, olive trees. And it's interesting that in this garden, he's led to um, pray these things that he prayed to the Father, and he has all this turmoil and, and this great, great agony that the other Gospels um, reveal. And it's fitting that it, it's called olive press because he felt this pressure, this intense pressure, knowing that what was about to happen and that he said at one point, as we see in the other Gospels, and if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. And there was no other way. So there was no other, that cup didn't get passed. But then he ended up saying, not my will, but your will be done. Now we're told in verse 2, And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So this garden was a very common place. We only really focus on it because of the Garden of Gethsemane, but it was a common place they would, they would go. Um, we're told there that um, there's language in the, the, the passage here that, makes, that reveals that there was, it was like a walled-in garden. It had boundaries to it. It was walled in. So they would meet there. They would discuss things. They would, it was probably a really common place to pray for him and his disciples. And so it was, so Judas knew about it. See, the, the question sometimes comes up, why didn't they just arrest Jesus anytime? Why would they do it at night and alone and sequestered away from the people? Because they feared the people. The people, they, people there was a lot of people that loved the Lord Jesus and they, they didn't want to upset them by having Jesus be arrested right in front of people. So they wanted to be quiet. And I, when we went over the upper room, we talked about how Jesus told, he, he dispatched or dismissed Judas and said, what you do, do quickly. There was a timing to everything. And, and so this, and Jesus talked about over and over again, it is hour has not come yet. And he said that over and over, there was a timing to everything, that there was a point at which his time did come. And this is his time. You know, and that's why he was pouring into his disciples, pouring into his disciples, trying to prepare them, trying to prepare them, putting them on a faith IV, so to speak, you know, just trying to get them to, to, to trust God and to get their focus on God. Because again, let's remind ourselves, their expectation was Jesus was going to be a political Messiah and he was going to rule from Jerusalem. He was going to take them out of bondage from the Romans and he was going to rule and set up his kingdom. And that's what they were expecting. Even on the day of ascension, we see that in Acts chapter one. They said to him, Lord, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This is after he's appeared to him for 40 days. 
You know, he still thought that this was going to happen then. But you see, when you study the scriptures, there's no place where he said that was going to happen. In fact, he was always trying to minimize the crowds. And the climax, it's only in John, the climax of all of that is when he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and all of that. And, and, and that's when everyone started, even disciples left. That was purposeful because he had heard they were talking about making him king by force. And that's what he was trying to avoid. So he said that purposely, even though poetically that has a true meaning, he, he said that purposely to weed out the crowd. You know, it's funny, in our culture, it's like everybody wants crowds. Everybody wants numbers. At, you know, but the thing is, numbers don't always equate to fruit. There's a lot of people with churches that are huge, but I mean, look at all through history. There's big churches that are either dead or off track or whatever. Jesus' letters to the seven churches and the Reve Revelation, he says to one of them, I think it's Church of Sardis, he talks about you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. No one, in, no one that went to Calvary Chapel Sardis, I like to joke and say that name, but would think that that church was dead. But Jesus' assessment was it's dead. So it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what other people think. What matters is what Jesus thinks about a church. So that's his assessment. So this hour had finally come. Now we're told in verse 3, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Lanterns, torches, and weapons. That's some serious stuff. So it says a detachment there in verse 3. That's another way of saying a cohort. A cohort was a tenth of a legion, and a legion was anywhere between 1,000 and 4,000 men. And each cohort had at least 600 soldiers. Uh, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they literally say about these soldiers that John doesn't. He says they were a great multitude. Now we picture... We've seen all these movies and things, you know, where they depict this. We, we, we feel like sometimes there's like 20 guys coming to arrest Jesus. That's how it's usually depicted, right? It's not what the scripture says. It's a lot of people. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of people. Hundreds and hundreds of people were part of this. And, and so there were six cohorts in Judah regularly, um, and 5,000 were in Caesarea, and these were officers, these were chief, these are officers of the chief priests. They were Levites. They guarded the gates of the old city. You know, there's a lot that they did. They were, they enforced the rules that the Sanhedrin laid out on the Temple Mount. And they were, they were obey, obeyed. These were thoroughly trained officers that he brought. Think about this. Someone has said this. It's not original. It's good because it's not original. Um, that, 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 that these men came with all these torches and lanterns, with all this light to arrest the light of the world. It's crazy. You think of these men coming to arrest God. It's really what's happening. They're coming to arrest God. Let's just stop and think about what that means. You're arresting God. Is that going to be successful for you if God doesn't want that to happen? No, that's not going to be successful. You're arresting God. Who are you going after today? What's on your schedule? What's on your calendar today? Just arresting God. You know, that's serious stuff. But, but that's what's happening. So if God didn't want this to happen, if, it, if the, the, the lamb wasn't slain before the foundation of the world, as we're told in scripture, see that the temptation is to think that things are careening out of control. The disciples thought this was careening out of control. But what we're going to look at is that Jesus is very much in control of all of this. And, and this is the most tragic time of his public ministry. This is the worst thing that could happen to him personally. And he's, he's in control of every part of it. And I want to look at five indications that Jesus was in control in this passage. So the title of my message this morning is just that five indications Jesus was in control. The first one that he was, that he was in control was foreknowledge. Look at verse four, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him. Notice it says all things. You know what all means in the original language? You guys are scholars. You guys are scholars. You know it means all. All means all. Um, and, 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 but, it, but this whole thing about him knowing all things related to this thing, that could be passed over. And so there, there wasn't one thing that happened to him that was going to happen that he didn't already know about. He had perfect foreknowledge of all of that. He wasn't learning anything about what was happening to him. He knew all of it was going to happen, which makes us love him even more because he knew all this was coming and still decided to yield to the father and say, 
This is the cup you have for me. This is the portion you have for me. I yield my life to you. And he did it for us. Unbelievable. So nothing was a surprise to him. And they're arresting God. Now, the second indication Jesus was in control is he went forward. Also in verse four, we're told he went forward. Now, that may seem like not a big deal. He went forward. But if, if um, you know, if you were being arrested and, you know, I was being arrested and, and we want to say something, we're about to say something. Are we going to step forward or are we just going to say right there? Are we going to be bold enough to step forward and go, you know, like I'm going to tell you something right now? We'd stay right where we're at in that group, you know, and we would say, I'm, you know, I'm good with this healthy distance, whatever it might be. I'm just going to stay here. Um, but he went forward in boldness. That shows boldness that you, you have to realize troops don't, aren't used to people when they're coming for them, actually making, you know, an advancement towards them. They could have thought that he was going to do something or come out, pull out a sword or try to attack them. The, you know, there's no way of knowing how they may misunderstand why he was stepping forward to speak to them. And so he was under, under, everything was under control here. Jesus wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid at all. There was no fear in him in all this. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what he would do. Everything. He was com- under complete control. He's been telling the disciples and others that there's a timing to all this. And so he, he knows this was coming, but then it doesn't stop there. The third indication Jesus is in control is he initiated the conversation. Look with me at, at the end of verse four and said to them, whom are you seeking? Why did he ask that question? Why did he ask, who are you seeking? He knew the answer to it. Why did he say it? There could be a lot of different reasons that we're, you know, we're not told, but I think it's very possible because he wanted them to say his name He wanted to give the answer that he gives in verse five. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am. That's it. That's what he said. I am. Did you see that? And the word he is in italics. He's saying, I am. Exodus chapter three, verse 14. When they came, when Moses came and when he was appearing before at the burning bush, and he said, who should I say is sending me? And he said, I am that I am is sending you. Jesus repeated this in John chapter eight, verse 58. We saw it when we were there. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And they got the message. They picked up stones to stone him. Why? Because they knew what he was saying. I am. That's what he's saying. I am. And Judas who betrayed him, were told, also stood with them. So, you know, you have to understand that he's making this claim there. And I just, can you imagine them hearing that? I just wonder, did it sound the same as his normal voice? Was it something, was it, did he use another voice to communicate that? Did he say, you know, I am, I don't know, but I just know that they would never forget him saying, I am. I know they wouldn't forget that. It was, I mean, was it like thunder loud and all around them? Was it, did he echo it? Did it, did it, I mean, it was, he was claiming to be God in human flesh, like literally indirectly, he's, they're saying you're arresting the, I am you're looking for, I am, why are you looking for me? You're looking for me to arrest me, but I, I am the, I am here. So I don't know if some of these soldiers became believers later. Maybe there's a lot of them. I would say it's likely. They can say, can you imagine having sitting down with your grandkids? And I remember when I was arresting Jesus and he said, I am. And what happened next was not fun in terms of what they what happened to them. But can you imagine telling that story? Let's say they, the ones that didn't receive him. Wow, there's something different about this man. No one's ever said I am and I go falling backwards. <laughs> um, but, but I don't think they would ever forget what happened. But we're told that Judas stood with them. Do you see that? The end of verse 5? Stood with them. Judas was standing with the apostles. Judas was standing with Jesus at one point. Most of it, the whole public ministry, he was there with Jesus. And every time people looked at him and wanted to know about Jesus, he was standing with Jesus. Now he's standing with the enemies of Jesus. Not good situation. We have to maintain that we stand with the, with the right crowd you know, right now, when we stand with the right crowd, those on the side of truth, history will look back 
and we'll be on the right side of history. It doesn't matter if the whole world comes against us and comes against God and fights against God. We're on the right side of truth. You know, God plus no one is a majority. And, and we're on his side. He lets us be on his side. We don't deserve it, but we're on his side. So, um, you know, Judas here is on the wrong side of truth, the wrong side of history. All the times we see him written about is usually, it says, the one that betrayed him. He's known for the one that betrayed Jesus. He's not known for standing with these guys uh, and, and being on the winning side of that arrest because the winning side wasn't the winning side. It was the losing side. The fourth indication that Jesus is in control is the power of his name knocks them down. Look at verse 6. Now, when he said to them, I am he, or I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Clearly, this is something supernatural that's happening here. Let's just remember who these people are. They're well-trained. They're well-trained soldiers. They're professional soldiers. They're well-trained professional soldiers. They don't just fall back. Out of nowhere, they're on, they're not, hundreds of soldiers are not just going to fall back. And I believe that Judas fell back too. <laughs> uh, that's not something that we usually talk about here. He's part of that group. I think he fell back too. Hundreds of these soldiers, professional soldiers, drew back and fell to the ground. They weren't afraid. They didn't lose their nerve. They didn't faint. This was Jesus saying, I am, and it caused them. I don't know how. I just know that it happened caused them to draw back and fall to the ground. They weren't just like tripping. This wasn't the three stooges being clumsy and tripping over each other. This is something supernatural. Something moved these guys. Something shook them. They should have just said, I'm out. <laughs> you know? uh, okay, there's something different. People don't just say I am and then I'm I hit, hitting the ground. I'm good. I'm dipping out. You know, nice to see you. Uh, I'm gone. They didn't do that. Maybe some of them did that we're not told, but what's revealed is that they didn't, they didn't, they weren't intimidated and they, they kept going. Usually they're not too afraid of rabbis. They're professional soldiers arresting a rabbi. What's to be afraid of? I mean, they're bold. Rabbis are really bold. Even today, the rabbis over there are very bold. They're very blunt. They're, they tell you what they think. They don't mess around. They're not, they're not subtle. <laughs> Jewish people in general are not subtle. Uh, they tell you what they think. That's one of the reasons why New York is New York with the the, the, the attitude that you get in New York it's from the Italians and the Jews, they have, they, they tell you what they think. There's no messing around with them. We're so, Ooh, I'm scared. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. They're like, Hey, get out of my face. That's just their normal talk. They're not being, they're not in their mind. They're not trying to be rude. That's just how they are. Oy vey. <laughs> Jesus was not armed. Jesus wasn't packing. Rabbis weren't packing. He didn't have a sword on him, but he said, I am. And they fell back and drew, fell to the ground. Now, Peter was packing. (laughs) Peter was packing. So Jesus is going to have to deal with this, but um, these people were professionals and this this took them off guard and and they they knew that there was something different. This verse seven, then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. It's another question. Have you ever wondered why he asked again? Now, again, he knew the first time when he asked. Now it's the second time he's asking, who are you looking for? Who are you seeking? And it's almost like he's leading them, trying to lead them to a conclusion, a very specific conclusion that this time or conclusion, this time he's asking after he said something and they fell to the ground, they drew back and fell to the ground. Hundreds of them fell to the ground. Now he's asking him one more time. And it's almost like he's saying, you're looking for someone, but who are you finding? Who are you finding? I'm asking you again, who are you looking for? Think about who you're finding as you're looking for this person. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, but finding he's more than Jesus of Nazareth. He's Jesus, the God man, the very one that John, the apostle, is trying to convince his readers to believe. So, of course, he's going to include this. Why didn't the other Gospels include this? Matthew, Mark, or Luke, they didn't include this because they're not trying to focus on Jesus being the God-man. Only the God-man can say something and have this reaction from these professional soldiers. Unbelievable that this is happening. They answer again, Jesus of Nazareth. It's crazy. Why would they even answer that again? 
that they answer it again. Unbelievable. What were they thinking? What, what do they think actually happened? What do they think, what caused them to f- draw back and fall to the ground all at the same time? I mean, it's just like, it's like insanity. It's picture like, what, are they poss- what could they possibly thinking? But yet they still arrest him. So it shows you it, it, if Jesus is trying to reach them by revealing who he is to them, it didn't, have, it didn't work, at least on the, enough people to arrest him. It wouldn't have taken any amount of people to arrest him. See, how, un, how unnecessary was it to bring hundreds of people? Jesus is going to say, look, I wasn't I with you in the temple every day? Because these are temple guards. They're assigned to the temple. Wasn't I with you in the temple every day? What, when you're coming, me, coming at me with, with clubs and swords, and was I that big of a threat? You could have, you could have arrested me any time. How many would it have taken to arrest Jesus? One person. Because he wasn't being taken by force. He wasn't being taken. He was offering his body. He was offering this. This is part of his plan. They didn't need anybody. He would have, he would have done it. It's crazy to think about. The fifth indication Jesus was in control is he tells them what to do. Look at verse 8. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, or I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Jesus wants the disciples to be let go. This is interesting because all three other gospels say that they forsook him. And we focus on that. He wanted to let them to be let go. From his perspective, he wants them to be let go. From their perspective, they're not willing to take the chance to stay. So they forsook him. It's interesting how you see that all working together. But he wants them to be let go. And they all took off before they could find out if they were going to let him go. They probably wouldn't, weren't going to because they want to they want to crush this thing. They want to put it down. They want it to end. They're tired of all this. This has been building. We've seen this as we've gone through the book verse by verse. It's been building. It's been building. It's been building. It's been getting worse and worse. More disruptions. They're not the Pharisees and leaders are not in control of the situation. They're used to always having the control. They're not in control now. What's been happening there in Jerusalem with Lazarus, especially as we saw him raised from the dead of being dead days, they can't control that narrative. It got away from them. That's why everything is like right now, the battle is over information in our culture. If they can control the narrative. They can control people's minds. They don't necessarily realize they're being used by the enemy, but they are. And that's why we have to say the truth to people. We have to be the ones that are sharing because they can't, they can't censor us. They can't stop what we say in person. They can try, but they're, they're, they, we are commanded to tell the truth and tell the gospel and not give up our confession. So the, the battle's always been over information. Now, these, these uh, uh, um, disciple or, um, Pharisees, they, it's out of control. They've lost the narrative. Now people are believing. Now they're, you know, the triumphant entry happened. You know, we saw that when we went through it. So they, they don't, they're probably not planning on letting the disciples go. They want this to be you know, done. They want this to be over in the, in the rear view mirror, so to speak. But disciples, they just, they just took off. John Mark had a, he most likely um, came from somewhere close by. He was wrapped in a, like a towel, a thing and him trying to run away. Someone grabbed it. He had to, he ran away naked. You say that, you see that in his gospel. (laughs) Um, That was a disaster. So they all forsook him. But Jesus wanted them to be let go. He didn't want them to forsake him. They, they wanted them to be let go by this, this, um, this group of, of officers here. Now, he tells us the motivation why, in verse 9, that, this, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. You may remember back in chapter 17, during the, his great high priestly prayer, which is really the Lord's prayer. It's the real Lord's prayer when he's praying to the father there. And, and he said in chapter 17, verse 12, those whom you gave me, I have kept and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. So that's what John is referring to. He's referring back to Jesus' prayer in John 17. And so this is now, you know, this is the dynamic that's happening, but that's not, that's not all that's going on here. In fact, we now get to the error of trying to help God out when he doesn't need our help. Look at verse 10. <laughs> then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off the right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So 
Peter goes, enough is enough. I'm taking out my sword. He's impulsive. He goes off his, you know, feelings. He goes by the seat of his pants. He doesn't think things through. A lot like us. In case you, you know, are getting critical of Peter. It's a lot like us. Very impulsive. So he, he tries to help God out. Now, you know, the whole, I mean, there's so many examples of the disaster of trying to help God out. And um, Moses tried to help God out with having, you know, having relations with his maidservant. That didn't do anything good. That didn't help anything. That's the result of that is a big worldwide conflict that even carries to today. The sons of, of Ishmael and the sons of Abraham, it all goes back to that. Because, because um, 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 a Abraham was trying to help um, God out. So, I mean, Moses... One of them is trying to help God out. Abraham, I've been on vacation. I can't track with all this stuff now. So yeah, Abraham, thank you. So um, what's the lesson here? The lesson is that, okay, so as we've looked at every single part of this, we can see that Jesus is in complete control. Now, I'm not criticizing Peter for not noticing all of that because I probably wouldn't notice all that in the moment as time by, you know, blow by blow and, and, and you know, scene by scene, action by action is happening. We're probably not noticing that. Either we can get all prideful and like, oh, why didn't he see all that? But you're just, you don't know this is going to happen. They had no idea this was going to happen. It just sprung on them. We're not, they're not noticing all this stuff. But the lesson for us is, you know, when God has a plan, now this obviously his plan was to die for us. So God has a plan and he has a plan for our lives too. And it's easy for us to think that, well, he's out of control. He's not in control of things. That's very easy for any of us to think at times. It's, I've waited too long. This isn't happening. It hasn't happened yet. So I'm going to help God out. We don't, we don't add anything to the situation that's good when we try to help God out. Because he doesn't need our help. God doesn't need to be protected by Peter. And he says that in other gospels. He talks about that. Because he, 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 it says here that Peter was trying to go for this. You know, most likely Peter's trying to cut this guy's head off, this Malchus's head off. Jesus didn't ask for help and he was not out of control. And, and, you know, he instead takes his ear off. That's how good fishermen are at sword, sword fighting. You know, he's trying, he wasn't trying to cut his ear off. He's not like, you know, would really protect Jesus right now. If I just get this guy's ear off, you know, then he can't hear on one side of his head. <laughs> That's not the goal for Peter. Peter most likely is trying to hit a head you know, and he's close by and all you have to hit is somewhere on the neck, <laughs> you know, and he can't do that. And honestly, if you're, if you're swinging the wrong direction, if you're trying to hit someone's head off, you're going this way. You know, if you're trying to slice off someone's ear, you're going this way. So I don't know if he's trying to come down on the top of his head and just go down that way. I, I have no idea. That isn't usually the way that you would do it. I don't know. Maybe someday we can ask Peter, you know, and ask him, but it wasn't, it wasn't very effective there. Um, and Jesus' response, look at verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? So the cup was the father's plan for Jesus. It included a plan of salvation. That was the cup there. And Jesus had submitted to it. And Matthew tells us that Jesus told Peter, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will give me more than 12 legions of angels. So when you do the math, that's, that's like 72,000 angels. Uh, now remember in the Old Testament, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. Okay, so they're pretty powerful. I would say that they're pretty... So if you do the math, it's over 2 billion people, all those, that legion, 12, you know, those legions could kill um, that many humans. So, but Jesus was submitted to the Father. He was submitted to his plan. So you could take the equivalent for your life, what you're wanting to help God out with. And, and, and usually it will compare somehow with something that God has that's equivalent to that many angels that could change the situation or a million other things that could change the situation that he could do if he wanted to, but he's chosen not to do it. You know, sometimes we forget that some of the times an answer to prayer is no. <laughs> it's No. Sometimes no is, we never hear that. It's always like yes or, or wait, or sometimes it's no. Most, some of the most loving 
expressions that God can give to us is saying no to prayers that we pray. I've said this before, and I've heard it from other people. I'm so thankful for the prayers that God didn't answer when I look back on, on walking with the Lord as long as I have. So glad that He didn't answer so many prayers because He knows what's best. That's the thing. It goes back to trusting our Father in heaven. He knows what's best for us. Jesus said He knows what we need even before we ask. He's, and he's doing things for us all the time. We didn't even ask for that they're good because he loves us, because we're his children. So we don't have to worry about him, you know, not doing what's best for us. We can trust him. We can trust that he will do what's appropriate for us. And Jesus trusted the Father, so can we. He trusted the Father as the power to do anything, so, so can we. And, and so he was in control the entire time. Peter would learn that. There would be no swinging um, swords anymore for Peter. One day when he's old, they're going to, they're going to, Jesus said at the end of John, and we'll see it, he, he led, he said, when you're old, they'll lead you where you don't want to go. When he's getting into John's business and saying, what about him and all this? And Jesus is saying, don't worry about him. What is he? If I want him to, I could have him be alive all the way till I come. But he, he's it's like, when you're old, you're going to be led where, where you don't want to go. And, and, and they, they did. They stretched out his hands and they crucified him upside down. It was his honor to do that. He didn't want to be crucified right side up because he, it was dishonoring to die in the same way which his Lord had died. But they did lead him where he didn't want to go. And it was a, he didn't, there was no sword fighting then. There was no fighting. It was total submission because he knew God could do it. God could break him out of whatever situation. That's why Paul, when he's writing the prison epistles, he's writing these epistles from, home, um, from Rome in prison He's already been broken out of jail multiple times. He knows that the, he could be out in a second. That's why he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus, a prisoner of Christ, because he knew that Jesus was sovereign over his life and he could do a jailbreak in a nanosecond. But he, there was a purpose why he was there. And usually when God says no, there's a purpose why we remain where we're at or in the situation that we're at. And what he wants us to do in those situations is to glorify him while we're in the situation. I'm not saying it's easy. But by God's grace and through prayer, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be yielded to the Lord Jesus in a time of great struggle because we just have to wait upon him and what he wants to do through our lives. So one thing I want to close with is, especially if we're yielded to him, there's no limitation on how he could use our lives. We are indestructible until he's done with us. Because God will protect us. And so we don't have to, he doesn't want us walking in fear for anything. But especially related to ministry, when we're stepping forth into ministry and we're afraid and, and we're afraid of being bold for the, you know, for the Lord with the gospel. Because the enemy wants us intimidated by the pushback that we see in the media and we see, you know, in all these different contexts, government entities and these things that are against our faith in so many contexts. Not all, but sometimes. I mean, God uses government to, he's an extension, I mean, he is an extension of him in many ways. But the things that go against our faith, he wants us to be bold and not worry about those things. Because yes, he may allow us to be in prison. He may allow us, I mean, I'm like number one on the list. They start putting people in prison for our faith. I'm the number, they know that they take me out, they, they affect a, 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 a church. So am I willing to do that? Am I willing to go to prison? I am. I'm not saying I, it would be easy, obviously, but I'm not going to compromise my faith because I'm going to be faithful by God's grace to my last breath. When they were threatening the apostle Paul, you know, when he was on his way to Jerusalem, they were trying to warn him. Prophets, New Testament prophets were trying to warn him of what was going to happen. And he said, none of these things move me because he had already died. He was already dead. That, that lordship issue was already settled. His life had already been given over. He'd already been broken out of prison. He'd already been on many missionary journeys. Second Corinthians outlines all the things that he suffered. That was before he went to Jerusalem and suffered. And people made a pact saying they're not going to eat or drink until he gets killed. And then he had to be brought out by night to Caesarea. Then he stayed two years in Caesarea. But God used him there. And Luke was able to write the gospel of Luke because he was there going all to all Jerusalem and interviewing people, Mary, all these people, getting his account for the gospel of Luke. Two years. Then when he was before Festus and Felix and appealed to Caesar, he, then he goes to the island of Malta, gets bit by, by, a, by a scorpion or whatever, snake or whatever it was, I forget. But 
And then God heals him, and then he goes and suffers a shipwreck getting to Rome. Then he's in prison multiple times. So before he even started going to Jerusalem, he'd already settled that. He'd already gone through all of that and settled that my life is not my own. We don't know anything about that kind of persecution here. But it could come, and we have to be ready and be willing to surrender to him. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this great message, and thank you that you are in control, Lord. Even the situation that you went through, Jesus, you were in control the entire time, and you are in control of our lives, those of us that know you. We yield to whatever plan you have. I pray that you would encourage those who are going through difficulty right now and struggling. I pray that you'd remind them day by day to trust you and put their focus on you and and for you to lift their heads and help them and encourage them. Father, and I pray that we'd be willing to do anything and say anything for you, Lord, and we just thank you that you want to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. We don't understand why you use us, but we're thankful, and we want you to use us greatly, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.